so it should show recording. It yes. is now recording, yes. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Fiona Shapiro, if you don't already know me. And I'm an environmental educator with the Sandia Mountain Natural History Center, um, which is a place in the East Mountains. And it looks a bit like this, or it looks like this. And um, we have 128 acres out there that are owned by Albuquerque Public Schools and have been since the 1950s. And we've actually been doing environmental education programming since the 1960s. Uh, we do, uh, we're known for our fifth grade program. So normally we'll have fifth graders come up to the mountains and there's a photo of me there um, leading a group out there and we'll take them for a hike and learn all about ecology and the ecosystems and animals and everything in the mountains. And I actually work for the New Mexico Museum of Natural History and Science. Um, so the program and our center now is a partnership between them and APS. So we work collectively um, to do our programming. So today we're gonna go for a hike together. And um, I know those of you that have attended previous programs of this series have been learning about kind of what to take on a hike, um, you know, tips on what to do when you're out there, about some of the animals, things like that. And today we're really gonna focus on the animals that live out in the mountains, particularly um, <clears throat> where I work in the East Mountains, but also they live throughout a lot of the area. Um, what evidence can we find of these species and these animals? And when are they around and when are they active, which we can learn in some interesting ways, which I'll show you. And here we go down the trail. So I just wanted to give you guys a little feel for what it's like to hike out there. This is our um, oldest trail, Mud Spring Loop, which people have been hiking on since the 1960s. And you can see we're in a nice forested area here. Um, we're going from the APS owned land onto Cibola National Forest land. And of course, all of this land has long been used and occupied um, by indigenous people, by the native Pueblos around the area. And you can see we've got um, a mix of, of uh, terrain and um, a mix of species. We're kind of at a transition zone in the mountains. So we're located at 7,000 feet and we have ponderosa pines, which you can see up ahead here um, are the tall trunks with the orange bark. We have pinyon juniper tree, pinyon pine and juniper trees, um, oaks, a whole mix of things. So that gives a lot of different um, habitats for wildlife, provides different food sources, um, and allows lots of different species to live around here. And now we're coming up to the spring. So if you're not familiar with natural springs, um, they are created when groundwater is above the surface of the land. So a lot of times the groundwater is underground, hence the name. Um, it can be feet underground, it can be a very far underground, or that groundwater can be um, at the surface or even above the surface. And then that provides a little drinking water area for um, wildlife to go. And so you can see they've got all this habitat, they've got food, especially herbivores have the food out there to munch on that's growing in between the trees. And then as we circle back around, we'll see that water source that they all um, love to go to. And there isn't a lot of water in the Sandias, there aren't rivers or lakes. Um, there's very few little streams, there is Tejeras Creek, that I know Talking Talons teaches and works at a lot um, that's down into Harris, but there's not much water. So this little pool right over here that just looks like a bit of mud <laughs> is actually important for the animals. And as we get up to it, you'll see there's a couple little black boxes on the tree here in the middle. And those are actually cameras um, that can take photos of the animals that come by. They're motion sensor and heat sensor to sense when those animals are visiting. There's just a couple more photos. You can already see there's a squirrel there. So when you approach Mud Spring, you'll often see a lot of birds and hear them. You'll see the squirrels running around. Um, there's a lot of good habitat, as I said but you won't see a lot of other animals because of course they like to hide away from humans a lot. They're not gonna really show themselves. Um, so that's why we have these cameras to get some really good photos. So throughout the time today, I'm gonna show you a lot of these photos. I just wanna introduce you to a couple other locations nearby um, that I'll also show you some pictures from. 
This is Paradise Spring, which has dried up. It doesn't have any water above ground anymore. It dried up around 2012, um, but sometimes animals still go there and we've gotten a lot of good photos of them in the past. And this is just a map of a bunch of the natural springs throughout the Sandias. Um, we're located over here at Mud Spring and that little orange dot is Paradise Spring showing that it's not above ground anymore. Um, the next closest spring to us is Coal Spring. It's up a steep hill and that's what that one looks like, but I won't have any photos from that one. But there are natural springs throughout the area, just not a whole lot of water in them. And a lot of them are drying up. Um, our last source of water for animals is one that we created. It's a little tub of water that links to a hose and a rain barrel that's next to this structure, which is called a bird blind. Um, and then that allows the water to fill in um, that pool from the rainwater, and it gives another drinking water source for the animals. So you can see in this photo, we've got a northern flicker flying. So we get some good photos of birds because the camera is positioned low to the ground. Um, and some other animals visited also, which you guys will see as we go. So besides these photos, um, we can also look for evidence of animals as we're hiking and exploring out in the woods. And so animals can leave behind all kinds of clues that we can then investigate. Does anyone have any ideas? And you can just unmute yourself since we're a small group. If you wanna give a clue that an animal might leave, you can use the chat and I'll try to monitor that also. So what are some evidence that animals that would leave, would leave behind? Paw prints. Yeah, excellent. They could leave their tracks or their prints, which I believe is the first thing on my list. Yep. Anything else? Yeah. Yes, and good job knowing that word. <laughs> I always love when everyone knows that word. Um, scat, if you don't know, is animal poop, animal droppings. And it sounds like a gross thing to look for or look closely at, but it actually teaches us a lot about the animals and what they've been eating and where they've been going. Um, any others? For our deer, they might leave, um, they could scratch their shoulders against the bark of trees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or their antlers if they're bucks. Excellent. Yeah, I didn't put that on this list, but that's a really good one. They can leave. I was thinking something. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Oh, thank you. I was thinking something similar that there might be evidence on the plant life, right? Broken branches or eaten leaves. Um, exactly. I haven't thought about the bark back scratching. Um, but yeah, some not on the ground, but just in the um, wildlife or, or rather the plant life around. Yeah. Exactly. And I used to do some wildlife research. At one point, I was looking out um, for signs of bighorn sheep in the California desert. And one of the things we looked for was browse, we called it, where they had bitten off the ends of branches of trees. Um, so definitely, that's a good one to look for. Um, another one is homes. So burrows under the ground, holes in trees, um, holes under rock ledges or roots. Um, food that they've eaten, I had on here. So you could also find like crushed up pinon shells or um, cactus that have bite marks in them, all kinds of things like that. Um, of course, nests of birds or even squirrels and some animals make nests um, or eggs. And of course, body parts too. Sometimes when an animal is killed or dies, but other times when they just molt and they drop feathers or they drop fur, or they lose their antlers for the year or something like that. And even trails. So we have um, what we call game trails where you might see an area where deer or bears or coyotes are, are going back and forth along that trail over and over um, that you can notice if you're looking closely. There's a couple examples. I won't tell you what animals those are from yet because we're gonna play a guessing game as we go. So here's back at the bird blind um, in a meadow area. This is a flicker, a type of woodpecker. And you'll see on all these photos, we can record, or the camera automatically records the temperature, the moon phase, which is kind of interesting, the date it was taken, the time, and then where it was taken. So um, we can start to learn when these animals are visiting, what time of year, um, if they get more common across, you know, over the years, um, all kinds of things like that, or even what temperature. Here's a flock of, I think they're Western bluebirds. It's a really vibrant color there. And this is a Stellar's blue jay. 
Um, this is a, they're pretty large birds. They make a lot of noise. Um, so you'll often hear them before you see them, but they're really beautiful to look at. And if you guys can see me on screen, or I didn't mention yet, those of you um, that didn't hear us talking about it, if you wanna pin me bigger or switch to speaker view, um, I think it'll be on the top right of your screen, then you should be able to see me biggest next to the presentation, because I've got some interesting things to show you guys. So this is a skull of a blue jay. Um, it's a model, it's not a real one, but it is the right size and um, shape and everything. And I'm sorry if my camera is not capturing it the best, but just kind of little, but pretty interesting to look at. Any bird has a certain beak shape and size that you can also help identify it from that. And then if you were looking for tracks on the ground and you're a really good tracker and looking really closely, you might see some tracks like this from birds. Little toes poking out. Um, I have a, this is a ladderback woodpecker in the snow. So that was kind of a cool photo. And then sometimes we get species, um, the ladderback woodpecker isn't in the mountains very often. And then this bird is a goshawk, which is one that local biologists actually um, watch out for. And they wanna know when we find that bird because it's a species of concern in the area. So sometimes we can even find rare species that come across our cameras. And we've got a lot of ravens and crows out there. Little owls. So you'll notice um, any of these photos that are in black and white were taken after dark. So this was 3.09 in the morning. Um, we have a special infrared flash that takes those black and white photos for us. And we think that the flash doesn't scare the animals quite as much as using a regular flash. We used to use a regular flash and there were times when animals tried to pull the camera off the tree. Um, one time I was told a bear actually succeeded in that and threw it into the spring <laughs> and ruined the camera. So yeah, <laughs> so we try not to scare the wildlife and we try to just, you know, sometimes they'll notice the cameras, but hopefully not be too scared or bothered by them. Uh, here we have a Cooper's hawk. These visit the camera a lot, um, especially the mud spring camera on that branch right there. And then I wanna show you guys what we can do with um, the information we learn from these photos. So I kinda do a lot of number crunching. I get a little nerdy about it and I create a bunch of graphs where we can start to look at patterns um, in when animals visit. So if you look at this one of the Cooper's hawk on the top left here, um, you can see that they kind of have a, a even pattern of slowly getting more and more frequent um, appearances into the spring, um, most common in June and July, and then it kind of tapers off into the fall and winter. So they're visiting most in kind of that mid part of the summer, at least at mud spring. They could be going other places all different times, um, but this is at the spring itself. And then um, temperature wise, we can see as it gets warmer and hotter, they are visiting more, um, which makes sense. You know, like if the hotter it gets, the more water they need, but we'll see later with some of the animals, that's not really the same pattern. So it's kind of interesting. All right, so any questions so far? All right. So we're gonna move into um, our game now. It's gonna go throughout the rest of the time. And I want you guys to see if you can figure out what animal, whose evidence this is, or who left these clues for us to find. Um, so we have some scat here on the bottom left. Um, I'd say that scat's probably a couple inches long. And then we have a bunch of tracks in the snow. So you can unmute yourself or type in the chat if you think you know what animal left these. Any ideas? And if you don't know yet, I have two more pieces of evidence from this animal. This is the side wing feather, and then this is the tail feather. And these are real. We found them out in the woods. So now does anyone know what this might be? Um, Cooper's hawk? hawk? Ooh, good guess. So it would look similar to this, um, but not quite. I think the Cooper's hawk, maybe feet would be a little smaller. This one, you can't tell from the photo, but it's like the length of my fingers. It's pretty large, but good guess. So this is from a turkey, wild turkeys. I don't know if you guys knew that we do have wild turkeys in the Sandia Mountains. So here's a photo of one with its tail feathers all splayed out there. 
Um, they do have those big feet. In the winter, I call it like turkey highway. They'll be walking up and back along the snow and the trails and you'll just see tons of turkey tracks. And here's another cool photo of one. And this one's really interesting. We've been getting this photo of this um, female for a while now. And I've learned that she is leucistic, it's called, um, where she has a, a genetic, a rare genetic trait that makes her kind of like partially albino where she has that white, those white feathers. Um, and I just learned that happens in about one out of every hundred turkeys. So it's, it's not very common. It's about 1% of turkeys. So it's pretty cool that we see her showing up. Oh, and I guess I missed a couple of things in the chat. Oh, sorry, Steve, I, did, I missed your guesses, Turkey. Good job. He, he guessed it right before you said it. So got it, got it. It's still counted. But <laughs> yeah, okay. Not a problem. Cool. You get a prize later. I don't have any, but. <laughs> um, so here's the visits of turkeys to Mud Spring. And the interesting thing about turkey visits is that um, they were gone from the Sandias for a good long while. People had hunted them out of the area. And I think it was 2004. Um, people took to wild turkeys from other places in New Mexico, captured them, and then re-released them in the Sandias to bring back our turkey population. And you can see in the first years after that, at least at Mud Spring, um, and there weren't many turkeys, but then they started to increase. And then they went way up. And we were getting like 75 turkey visits in 2014 and a, over 100 in 2015. And a lot of times they come in big groups too. So they have a lot of babies, they reproduce a lot, you know, and then they can expand their population pretty quickly. So that's a real success story that we've brought back the turkeys. All right, whose evidence is this? So I'll give you a hint that these are pine cones that were eaten by something. And then this, there's a little burrow under there, a little home that this animal uses. Any idea? So my first yeah. guess was a bear, but I think that's probably wrong based on how you <laughs> described the pictures. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. go ahead, <laughs> other guesses? Maybe a chipmunk? I don't know. Oh, so close. It is a squirrel. <laughs> so this is called an Abert squirrel. You can see it coming right out of its little hole there. Um, and they only live, this species of squirrel only lives in the Sandias at 7,000 feet and above basically, because they live where the ponderosa pine trees are because their favorite food is the ponderosa pine seed cone or cone seeds. So the seeds out of the pine cone. And you can see in this photo, there's a squirrel right above the temperature. I think it's holding a pine cone in its mouth. And then here are some photos that my coworker took um, where you can really see it, like holds it kind of like we would hold corn on the cob and it'll kind of just eat its way around and eat all those seeds. Um, they're, and they have like kind of those long finger-like toes so that they're able to grab it and really uh, and eat it that way. Oh, you saw one hanging off over Travertine Falls, cool. That's a pretty place, I like it over there. Yeah, they're pretty uh, common. They run around a lot. They're out in the winter, you can see, even in the snow sometimes. Um, very hoppy and runny, so you'll often just see them racing by. And this is another type of squirrel that we also have in the mountains, and I think it's also the same species down in the city. This is called a rock squirrel, and they like these more meadow areas, like over at the bird blind camera. All right, next one. Whose evidence is this? We've got some scat on the left and some tracks in the snow on the right. And a clue about this one is these are the front feet at the top here, those little ones. And then these are the back feet in the middle. Rabbit. Yeah, nice job. You knew it. Yep, so rabbits, they have round little pellets of scat. I do have some real rabbit scat here too. I can show you on the screen. So when you're able to look closely at it, you can see it's got, um, little tiny bits of vegetation and grass that they've been eating. It can be in a little pile like this, or sometimes as they're walking, they'll poop and you'll have little like circles of pellets of, of poop all across the ground. Um, I would recommend checking your lawn the next time you're out in a, or outside or in a city park and you might find some rabbit scat. And that is their tracks. Um, their tracks look very similar to squirrel tracks though. So really it's just that their feet, back feet are gonna be a little bit longer 
Um, and if, you, if the tracks end at a tree, you know it's a squirrel because rabbits can't climb trees. <laughs> There's a photo of one. And here's one visiting the bird blind. You can see this is good habitat for it because there's lots of grass and plants to munch on. But they also sometimes go into the woods. Um, they're very common in the city. So these are, um, I think they're all desert cottontail rabbits. And we don't have the jackrabbits up there. So those are out on the mesa and drier, lower elevation. Um, but in the mountains, we have these littler guys, the cottontails. Oh, and this one I didn't have any evidence for because it's most common evidence would be smell, of course. And I don't have smell of vision, unfortunately. We don't have that yet. <laughs> um, but this skunk, they would have little tracks, you know, kind of little short oval, like maybe a couple inches long. Um, but I've never noticed them. They're kind of hard to see their tracks, I think. Um, but they are out there in the mountains. A lot of you have probably, I know I've smelled them in my neighborhood. So a lot of you have probably smelled them or seen them, you know, maybe by the river or in different places, they're pretty common around the area. And even in the snow, we have one out. So that was cool to see too. And there's its, its back end, maybe spraying the camera. Um, they don't wanna spray a lot though. They actually try not to spray because it takes them a while to get that chemical, to remake that chemical in their body. And it takes a lot of energy to do it. So they're gonna try to not spray you if they can help it. Um, it's more often like if dogs are running up to them or things like that, then they're more likely to spray. And here's our skunk visit. So you can see um, at Mud Spring again, we used to not have any skunks visiting. And then we started to get small numbers um, all of a sudden, and I don't know why, but it shot up in 2016. We had about 75 visits um, or days that were visited is what this is. And then it went back down. And then this last year in 2020, it went way up again. Um, one guess I have for this last year is that maybe it's because um, of course the pandemic's been going on. And even though the pandemic doesn't affect the animals direct, these animals directly necessarily, um, it does affect them because there weren't as many humans on these trails or visiting Mud Spring. Um, Cause I've been working from home. Most of my coworkers have, we haven't been taking fifth grade classes out there all year. So some of these animals might've been like, oh, it's nice and quiet out here. There's no humans around. They're not here to bother me, you know? And maybe they're, they're out visiting more at the spring. I don't know. Um, we've also had a couple times where we released skunks um, or we've taken them. There was our, our, an intern of ours that was rehabilitating um, some skunks and then we released them at the spring. So that could also definitely account for that big increase in numbers because we actually put more skunks there. <laughs> Um, and then you can see the times they visit. You guys might have known that skunks are nocturnal. Um, so they are pretty much going to visit at in the nighttime. Um, and even early morning time is likely before sunrise. They don't, they do come out during the day. I've seen them sometimes during the day, um, but more often at night. All right, am I, any questions or comments? Cause I know I'm sharing a lot with you guys. So I just wanna take a pause if anyone wanted to ask anything. And I'll also try to leave time for questions at the end. <laughs> I tend to talk a lot. All right. And feel free to jump in if there is something you want to know about something I'm sharing. Um, and yeah. Are these raccoons? Yeah, nice job. I didn't even have to ask it yet. Awesome job. Yep. So it looks like little human hands, but with claws on the end um, is one reason raccoons are so good at getting into things. They're known for getting into trash and all that because they can use their little hand-like feet to grab at things. Um, so nice job identifying that. Um, it's really common to see raccoon tracks along the river and in muddy areas. Um, they like water. So we don't know, there might not be too many raccoons in the mountains. We don't get a lot of pictures, um, but every once in a while we do, and it's pretty cool. And this shows the visits also going way up in 2020, which again, could because of the, because people not being around, um, but it's hard to know, you know, this isn't official scientific research. I just put together the data from the cameras. So I'm not trying to make any claims about, you know, why or why not animals are there. Um, but it is interesting to see that, you know, they visited a few times a year and then all of a sudden it's 33 times or something. 
All right, this one, I'm going to give the disclaimer that the person who took this photo was not sure it was this animal, but it's hard to find evidence of this animal. Um, so this might be a tricky one. <laughs> it's a nocturnal animal. Um, most people haven't heard of it or don't see it much. So it's a less common animal. Does anyone want to take a guess at it? <laughs> Possum? Oh, that's a good guess. Um, we don't have possums around here, um, but it's kind of the size of a possum. It is a ringtail. Has anyone ever heard of ringtails? They're actually very common around here, um, but a lot of times people don't know they exist. Um, or they'll call them ringtail cats, but they're not actually a cat. Or they also look like lemurs. They might look like, you know, a, a lemur in Madagascar. Um, but instead, they are related to raccoons. So they're actually the cousin of the raccoon family, or they're in the raccoon family, I think. Um, and they've got that tail to prove it. <laughs> they are very nocturnal. You see all these photos are at night. Um, and they're kind of like the squirrels of the night, I call them. They kind of do acrobats in the trees. You can see here it is at Paradise Spring going right near that same stump that the squirrels like to hang out at. So they're really cool um, and they come by a lot. So we can see here again with the graphs, um, they've been kind of coming a little bit over the years and then it kind of increased a lot and then went back down actually. Um, this is comparing Paradise Spring to Mud Spring. So again, we used to have water at Paradise Spring until 2012. Um, and then you can see their visits there dropped off a lot and then they went over to Mud Spring. So you can see they actually switched water sources when they realized, oh, there's no more water here, but about like quarter mile away from there, there's a bunch of water or enough water. Um, and again, they are nocturnal, so visiting in the dark. This is kind of cool. We released this ringtail also in Mud Spring. Um, it was found in Old Town in a woman's yard and she had called one of us and we agreed to release it for her. So it's the only time I've seen one during the day and I've only seen one once before um, at night. So really cute, just up in the tree there. <laughs> All right, whose evidence is this? Got some tracks and some scat. Anyone know? It's a different shape Peter. of them. Yeah, there you go. Nice job. Yep, so I was just about to say it's a different shape of a foot there. That is a hoof print. Um, on these, you can see the dew claws, they're called, which are in the back. You don't always see those in the track. Um, and then we have some nice, fresh, wet looking deer scat up there, which I always compare to chocolate covered peanuts or chocolate covered coffee beans. Um, kind of looks like pinions too, but you don't want to eat it. <laughs> oh, here I have a little bit of it in person too, just to see the size. So it's not very big, but they will poop kind of like a big pile altogether. And another piece of evidence I wanted to show you guys from a deer is this jawbone. So we will often find um, parts of deer like skeletons or jaws or legs of them sometimes that maybe mountain lions or animals have killed. And um, it's really interesting to look at them. This, you can see the teeth on it. And you probably notice those teeth are flat. Um, so that tells us what the deer eats. And you probably know that deer are herbivores, right? So they're gonna eat lots of plants. Um, they're gonna grind the leaves and the branches and all that they're eating on these nice flat teeth. And you can see they have that really long jaw, much longer than mine. <laughs> And here are some deer photos. So they are a common visitor in the woods. They really like it out there where there's lots of room for them. They can munch on those maple leaves um, or across the way, there's a whole hillside of oak trees they can eat. Um, a lot of times we get whole big groups of them like this. And this one I really like because it's a doe watching her fawn, her baby. And I imagine that she's saying like, what are you doing sticking your snout in that hole? You're gonna get it bit off by a, by a um, squirrel. <laughs> so yeah, but it looks like a curious kid. Makes sense, right? And it looks like she's kind of like, huh, what are you gonna do? But I love watching the fawns and the, the families that visit. Here's a young buck. It's got those little starts of antlers, little velvet on them. And an older buck, this is over at the bird blind camera in the field. 
Um, so a couple points on that buck's antlers already. And this one I just think is funny. It, um, the water level was low in the trough, so it had to kneel down to get to the water. <laughs> And you can see here, this is the photo showing um, all that food that's there for the deer. And there was a time when this forest here around the spring was a lot more filled in and there were more trees and there weren't these lower bushes and shrubs near the ground. And deer don't really like that because they can't eat those leaves way up high. And actually most of these are pines and they don't eat the needles, I don't think. Um, so they want that lower, the lower bushes to eat. Um, and what happened here was people came in and they cut down trees on purpose and they set a fire. They actually did what's called a prescribed burn, um, which can actually be good for the forest. If it's a small fire and it doesn't get huge and out of control, then it opens up space and it creates more habitat. Um, and then in the years since the fire, we think more deer are coming to this area, maybe because of that, or at least partially because of that. Um, the fire here was done, I think, in 2014, so they had already been around. Um, and then we also had other thinning that was done and cutting of trees that was done um, nearby in an earlier year. I think it might have been around 2008. So again, we don't know that's why, but it is providing more food for them. It's a better habitat for them now that we have a more open forest. And the month one, I just kind of wanted to show that like deer pretty much are visiting throughout the whole year. Um, less in the, you know, January, February, but they come year round. All right, next one. Whose evidence is this? We've got a lot of scat here. <laughs> Any guesses? No guesses this time? All right. So what we have here is Oh, this one, I guess. Oh, I was just thinking maybe some sort of cat creature. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're getting there. Um, this time, it's more of a canine family member. Um, but the cat family member scat can look similar sometimes. Um, it, depending on what animals are eating, they can have different looking scat sometimes. So this animal um, eats a lot of different things. This like kind of splotchier, wetter scat, I think is from the young, from the younger ones, maybe even ones that are still nursing, I've heard might be what causes that. Um, and then the ones that are more like shaped like actual poop um, can have seeds in them, fur. Yeah, yes. Is this a coyote? Oh, you are so close. And actually, it's very, very hard to tell the difference between this animal scat and coyote scat. So some of these could be coyote. Um, but what I'm getting at is a fox. Um, but like I said, fox, coyote, scat's going to look very similar. Um, fox scat is just smaller. So here is our gray fox. Um, they really like it up in the mountains because they are the only member of the canine family that can um, climb trees. They can actually spread their toe pads apart and go up in the trees. So they like the forest, um, really pretty looking. And they come by the spring a lot of times at night, um, sometimes during the day though. There's during the day. And sometimes we'll get groups, the, um, they'll pair off and they'll stay together with their mate. Um, and then they also have babies. And I love this photo. It's an older one, but it's so cute. That little kit, the little fox right there. Um, so the whole family stay together. Um, they will visit at all different times of day and night, but like I said, more at night. And temperature wise, um, they kind of don't visit when it's super cold, don't visit when it's super hot, but everywhere in the middle, pretty much they're visiting. So they're not too picky about what the temperature is. They'll come, they'll come around all through the year. All right, so this one, a little bit bigger scat, also can have seeds in it, like juniper berry seeds. It can have peach pits or apricot pits. It can have fur like this one in the middle. And then this is a den that my coworker was peeking into, hopefully not about to get his head bit. <laughs> um, any guesses of what this one is? I'll give you a hint. You already said it. <laughs> Coyote. Yep. <laughs> I like that in unison. 
So this is coyote scat. Again, it can be very similar to fox scat, just bigger. Um, we find a lot of coyote and fox scat in general because they're known to mark their territory. So they'll poop on purpose right on big rocks like here and they'll poop right on the trail because they want us and they want other animals to know like, this is my space, this is my territory. Um, so they're not shy about, <laughs> about their poop. <laughs> and there is a coyote at the bird blind. This is a good spot for it to hunt for mice or rabbits. So they come there a lot and sometimes they go into the woods also. They'll also live in the city, they'll live um, by the river, they'll live you know, right on a city block. So they're very um, adaptable. They're not very picky about where they live. So oh, they had poop on the sidewalk at the base. Yeah, is that what you're gonna say? Yeah, that's, yep. that's funny. Yep, so they want us to know they're there. <laughs> And it's funny, you know, they, they really, you would think they'd prefer it in the mountains and in the woods, but they, they live all over. They, you know, they live right in the city. They live in the most urban environments um, and they eat so many different things. So they're omnivores. And I actually have a coyote skull here. This is a model one. Um, sorry, the lighting's not great again, um, but you can probably see here, we've got some sharp teeth for them to eat mice and rabbits and um, lizards and snakes and all kinds of animals. And then they have the molar flat teeth in the back of their mouth um, for eating those seeds, for eating cactus, for eating um, pinyons. I don't know if any of you like pine nuts, pinyons, the seeds from the pinyon pine tree. Yep. Um, they eat those too. So they're true omnivores. They're, they'll eat a lot of different things, which is probably one reason they can live in a lot of different places. Um, we get them day and night. And sometimes a group of them, they do tend to travel in groups, but not always big packs. They can also be by themselves and in the winter also. Actually, I, I hear them and see evidence of them probably more in the winter sometimes. And here we can again see kind of their patterns. Um, they are not like foxes as much where foxes are mostly coming by at night to the spring. They're more active coming to the spring all through the day and night. Um, we had a peak of them in 2016. Again, I don't know why. Um, sometimes if there's a lot of rabbits and a lot of food available, their populations increased. Um, and they pretty much come at any temperature, um, except for really cold and really hot. All right, next one. What could this one be? We've got some scat. Um, and this is always a good way to take photos of scat, by the way, or tracks or things you find. Um, if you're trying to document it, to put a ruler next to it. Or if you don't have a ruler, put like a pencil or I put my key the other day, like something where people will know the size of it and they'll be able to compare. Um, so this is about four and a half inches long. And then we've got that track. This is actually a cast we took. So we poured plaster in the track, let it harden, and then um, we're able to save the track that way. So any guesses? Bobcat? Ooh, you're on a roll. Nice job. Yep. Yeah. How do you know it's a bobcat? Do you have any ideas? Um, so it doesn't have the claws of the dogs because cat can retract their claws. And then I think it's too small to be a mountain lion. That is a perfect answer right there. Yep. Exactly. So you won't see the claw marks usually because they pull in their claws. Um, a coyote or a fox track, you're pretty much always going to see the claws. Oh, I don't think I showed that. So here is the, um, this is a fox track. So if you can see there are claws um, showing at the top there. So that's the difference. Um, also the bobcat track is a little rounder and then the fox track is a little more oval. Um, so that's another way you can tell. Um, excellent. Yeah. And then um, it is smaller than a mountain lion track, which we'll get to in a bit. Um, oh, no, I have a photo. I'll show you guys the one. Um, and you, if you look closely at this scat, it looks like it has a bunch of fur in it and bobcats are carnivores. So that makes sense. So here are some bobcats. There's two of them here. And I think they really only stay together if they're a family. Um, so those could be siblings or um, a mom and a young, it's hard to tell, um, but really cool. <laughs> I like that one. It looks like it's vocalizing, making some noise there. 
and this is an older one, but I just love how it's coming right past the camera. And it's this one's at the bird blind, as you can see. So this is also a good spot for it to hunt for mice and rats and rabbits and other other critters like that that might be in hiding in the grass. And it also visited Paradise Spring, which as you've seen, there's not many photos there because recent times there's no water, but it came by anyway. All right, so this is interesting. So here we have a track on the right. Um, it's, it is larger than the last one, I'll tell you. And then on the left, if you kind of want to look away, it's kind of gruesome, but that is a dead deer that is kind of shoved underneath a, a log. So something killed this deer is what I'm getting at. What do you think? Mountain lion. Yeah. <laughs> Yep, this is a mountain lion kill site. We actually found um, a, um, mountain lion scat near it. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture, but it was like a big pile of brown scat. And it was smelly because the mountain lions like to eat the organs of the animal. Um, also a little gruesome, but they are carnivores. So, and you'll see there's no claw marks on the track again. And there's our mountain lion. Pretty cool. We don't get a whole lot of photos of them. Um, cats can actually get a lot of their water out of the food they're eating. So they don't always like visit sources of water all that often. Um, and they can travel for many, many miles. So they could go, you know, dozens of miles. They can travel from the mountains all the way up and across them. Um, they do go down by the base. I actually know that there's, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with it at all, but there's been some scientists that have studied mountain lions. Um, from Kirtland Air Force Base and they'll radio color them and put these GPS colors on them. And then they can track where they go. And they found that they go like all around the base. I think the same mountain lions might've gone up into the mountains where I work from the base. So that is pretty far away. <laughs> um, they'll go across the city maybe in the dead of night. Um, they're not often seen by humans. Oh, and I got to a really exciting picture here. Um, they're not often seen by humans, but um, they can be right near us. I always tell kids when I'm teaching, like, there could be one right over there, um, and you won't know it because it'll stay really quiet and stealthy. It's very rare they want to show themselves to humans. Um, and this is a family of mountain lions. So again, um, like the bobcats, they won't usually be together unless it's like a mom and, and her kids. Um, they don't look like kids. They don't look like kittens because they're very large, but they can grow pretty quickly and um, the babies will stay with their mom for about one and a half, two years, I think, um, to kind of learn how to be a mountain lion, you know, learn how to hunt, learn how to find water, learn where to go, and then they'll split off on their own. Um, so full adult mountain lions, you wouldn't see them like this. And that was the way we actually knew about the mountain lions that went between the, or we think they went between the base and us because it was a family and it's so rare to see that whole family together that it, it was in the same year and, and that was pretty cool. And when looking right at the camera, so sometimes they do notice that the camera's there. <laughs> All right, this is our second to last um, animal evidence guessing. What do you think these are from? I can give you guys some clues here or tell you what these things are too. So this is a track in the top left. It's quite large. Um, and then here's some scat, oops, some scat with a sprout of a plant growing out of it. Um, some scat with bird seed, again, very large. Some scat with bear corn seeds, which is this little plant over here on the right that, that um, grows out of the roots of oak trees. This animal mm -hmm. really likes that food. And then the bottom right is actually a spot where a rock used to be and the animal moved the rock out of that spot. So any guesses? Bear. <laughs> it is indeed. Guess. You guys are great at this. And here is some more evidence because bears leave so much evidence because they're so big and it's so interesting to look at. So here's bear tracks in the snow. Um, you can see the front foot is the shorter one and then the back foot has that whole heel at the back there. Um, we've got a scratch mark on a tree, so they'll rub their back on trees and leave the fur behind, and then they'll also scratch it sometimes. We've got some more scat, so in the top left, this is prickly pear fruit, so they'll eat the fruit from the cactus, um, and then it didn't look like it had digested much, it just kind of pooped most of it out. 
Um, in the top right, we have unfortunately scat that we found near our buildings that has trash in it. Um, so we never like to find that. Um, I think I had, oh, where did my trash, here it is. So here is some real scat I have right here. This has all been dried out and preserved, so I wouldn't be touching it if it was fresh, um, but there's a plastic bag right in that scat. So that's why we really need to be careful about, especially people who live near the mountains, or if you know you live in an area with bears, with raccoons, with animals that might wanna eat your trash, you know, try to have really good lids. Like we thought this dumpster was pretty bear resistant, but we found out nothing is <laughs> bear proof. And the bear managed to, to pull up those handles. And then one day it tipped the entire dumpster over. Um, so we had to get a new dumpster and now it has like a locking mechanism and a bar across and like, it's hard for us to open. So we don't think the bears can do it. Um, but you wanna be really careful about that because unfortunately we ended up feeding bears a lot of fifth grader lunches um, and trash from it that we had in our dumpster. Um, and here's another more natural scat um, that is made of pinon shells all crushed up in the bottom right here and the baby bear scat right next to it. So that's what it should look like. <laughs> and here's some bears for you guys. Very cool. I'm always excited when I see bears on the camera and I bet you didn't know you wanted to see a bear drooling, but <laughs> that was really funny. It must have just been drinking and then it's got some drool hanging there. Bear butt. <laughs> and I like this photo too because you can see how thick its fur is and how um, well it would protect it in the winter. And when it gets too hot, like on this 82 degree day, um, it'll, they'll actually lie down in the mud or the water and try to cool off. And I bet you that bear really wishes the spring had more water in it because <laughs> uh, it's barely getting any cool from that, I'm sure. And they come by day and night, um, more often during the day though, actually. And here we have families again. So here's a mama bear and then her one cub and a second cub coming down the hill. So cute. I think these are um, first year cubs because they're so little. Um, so they'll be born, um, I think in the spring, early spring, late winter. And then they come out of the den with their mom and um, they start to grow quickly, I'm sure, as they start eating. Uh, here's one that looks a little bigger standing up next to its mom. And um, you might have noticed they have different fur color. Um, so all of the bears we have in this area are black bears. We used to have grizzlies, but they were hunted out of the area by humans. Um, so we don't have grizzlies anymore, but we have um, black bears that can have different fur colors, just like we can have different hair colors. And at night, <laughs> I like that one. It's probably just yawning, but it almost looks like, you know, growling or something, but they don't really do that. And they don't usually like the open meadow by the bird blind because they like to be able to climb trees if they need to escape from something. That's kind of an instinct held over from when there were grizzly bears because grizzly bears would sometimes attack black bears. And so the bears would run up in a tree. Um, so they don't come here too often, but every once in a while. And a little bear data for you. So they're most often going visiting mud spring in the woods um, in June and July. Um, and through the rest of the summer and fall, they pretty much disappear in the winter. Um, they go to their dens. They're not always hibernating all winter. Sometimes they'll come out of their dens a little bit um, if there's not snow on the ground and if it's not too cold, they'll come out. Um, but we haven't found any winter bear dens near um, these sites and near our trails. So, And then temperature wise, they'll kind of come more when it's like 50 something all the way up to pretty hot temperatures to get water. And as I said, they'll visit more during the day hours, um, but also in the evening and a little bit at night. Um, this is just showing, um, again, when the spring dried up at Paradise Spring, they switched over to Mud Spring. So it just really clearly shows, you know, as soon as that water source dried up, they had to go find another one. And luckily they were able to, not too far away. And we've gotten a lot of bears last year. So again, that could be because of less humans or it could be another reason. All right, last one, whose evidence is this? Who left these tracks in this trail? 
Humans. Fifth graders. <laughs> Yep, 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 yep. Yeah, fifth graders left the handprints for sure. I think these are adult tracks here. And of course, the trail that we made and people continue to walk on. So lots of fifth graders. This is a class I taught one day a few years ago. Um, people bring their dogs. This is my coworker, Toby. <laughs> so we can't forget about the fact that humans are everywhere out there too. And I just wanted to show you guys, like obviously I've talked about some animal evidence, but of course there's lots of other animal evidence you could find. So there's woodpecker holes. These little ones are from sapsucker woodpeckers. Um, I think this is a snake egg in the left here, a little insect um, mound in the dirt, spider webs, um, gopher mounds, rabbit holes. These are bark beetle carvings over on the right here on the tree where the bark beetles eat their way inside the bark and make cool designs. Um, a bear day den where they'll actually like sleep during the summer um, when they don't need a full den and nests and all kinds of other things. So there's tons of evidence out there if you're really looking um, of our animals. And of course there might be some dead animals too. So we have um, a pile of feathers that something ate, a dead skunk, a snake shed, some bear fur, a dead turkey, um and deer skull and all kinds of things like that um the next photo or the next page will have a photo of a snake if anyone can't see snakes or doesn't want to you're gonna want to look away now i should have warned you guys about the dead animals too i meant to do that so i'm sorry if anyone was bothered by that um so this is just the camera shy animals so of course there's lots of other animals we're not going to get on our wildlife cameras like lizards like red-tailed hawks that usually wouldn't come down to the water in the middle of the woods um, like the gophers that live underground, like gopher snakes that, you know, the camera is not going to notice or get pictures of. So there's so many other animals, hundreds of species living in our mountains um, that we also don't get on these cameras. And I didn't get to really talk about today. And even more camera shy animals. Um, we did get a spider picture one time. That was cool. Walking across the camera. <laughs> But there's tons of spiders, there's beetles, there's grasshoppers, there's praying mantises, moths, butterflies, bees, hornets, wasps, so many other animals, you know, so many insects and, and arachnids and all kinds of things um, that I also didn't really cover today, but just know there's so many out there. Um, we got a bat one time. So these are just a few last pictures of ones that we don't normally get, but down here, these are the wings and then the head um facing the camera that was a really cool photo to get um, we get a couple times when animals visit together so we have a bobcat there and a skunk and then a deer and a ringtail looking at each other and then a skunk and a mountain lion and you might wonder what's going to happen between a skunk and a mountain lion um we this was years before i was there but from what my coworkers have told me they came to the camera and they smelled skunk and yet they found a dead skunk so the skunk probably sprayed to defend itself um, but the mountain lion didn't really care and it went after it anyway uh, but the most common predator of a skunk is actually a great horned owl because they don't smell the scent and they just swoop down really fast and they're not bothered by, by the skunk spray. <laughs> and I just ended with a couple funny ones to remind you guys to have some fun when you're out exploring or whatever you're gonna do after this program, be silly like the bears. <laughs> so thank you for joining tonight. Um, thank you for to Talking Talons for hosting and for the Bernalillo County Open Space for um, funding you guys. Um, this program series. And if you guys want more information on the place that I work, the Sandia Mountain Natural History Center, you can head to nmnaturalhistory.org slash smnhc or just Google our name. Um, we've got activities on there. We also have a YouTube channel. We've been posting lots of videos throughout the pandemic year. Um, so we've got um, lessons about ecology. We've got like videos where we explore different parts of New Mexico. We just released one on mountain lions, so check that out. Um, all kinds of cool stuff. And you can like and follow us on our Facebook or our Instagram if you wanna find out, um, see more photos. And then on Facebook is where I post about public days. So we don't have them often, but in normal times, we will have public days where we'll open up our grounds and our trails to anybody, to you guys. 
and you can come visit and go for a hike. Um, we have astronomy nights, all kinds of things like that. Um, and then a good way I wanted to mention, I know we're running out of time here, but I just wanted to mention that um, on iNaturalist, if anyone's not familiar um, with, there's an app and a website called iNaturalist, and you can post photos you find of animals or scat or animal sign, um, and people can help you identify it if you're not sure what it is. And you can also look through other people's photos that they've contributed, especially if you check out our projects, which are the names here, New Mexico Nature Mapping and New Mexico SCAT. So you can look through what people have found in the past. Um, and if anyone wants to contact me, if you have questions, if you wanna you know, um, rent out our site in the summer, except we're not doing it this summer right now, um, you can always email me. So that brings me to the end of my program and I'll take any um, last questions or things you guys wanna share. Thank you, we appreciate it. You're Thank welcome. You. Being us watch. Thanks, Thanks for coming. I hope you enjoyed. Yes, thank you. That was outstanding. Thank you so much. Oh, good. Glad you liked it. And I'm going to stop recording.